Good afternoon, everyone, and my name is Fabian, and we are coming live to you from the National Museum of Singapore. In today's special program, we actually have uh, Chef Damien, who is a Heritage Cuisine Champion and MasterChef Singapore judge. He will be actually sharing with us how to unwrap the secrets to making a traditional Eurasian Christmas pie. He will also be sharing the different influences that uh, resulted in the creation of this dish, as well as memories, his fondest memories of uh, celebrating Christmas with his family through the years. So, Chef Damien, please. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Damien De Silva, um, and I'm the chef at Restaurant Kin. Um, so, basically, Eurasian pie originated more towards the 19th century. Uh, the reason why I say this is because it's more British than it is Portuguese or Dutch. Yeah? Um, the influence of the British is very relevant in terms of the pastry. There's usually puff. Um, most of the time, that's what we use. We would use puff pastry. And of, of course, with potatoes and carrots, and of course, sausages as well. Um, it is it's a very English, um, I would say, ingredients, you know. And then we have meatballs. Um, you can use either pork or you can use beef. Here we're using beef. Um, and then chicken. We tend to use more the dark meat rather than the breast meat. Why? Because the breast meat tends to be very dry and the dark meat has got a lot more flavour as well. Okay? Um, the key ingredient in, in the Eurasian pie is the spices. Now, the, spi the spices have an Indian influence because you have things like nutmeg, you have things like cinnamon, star anise, uh, black pepper, uh, and cloves as well, right? This is what the Eurasians call a stew spice. So whenever we make a stew, we would use these five uh, spices. We blend them together. Of course, we toast them first, and then we blend them together, and then we add it into the stew. What this does is that it gives the pie um, a lot more flavour rather than just, you know, rather than just salt. Um, of course, you have the flavour that comes from the chicken and from the beef as well. But I think more importantly, um, the Indian spices tend to elevate the dish to a very, to a higher level. Okay? Now, you can also take the spices and marinate the meatballs with it. Otherwise, your meatballs will be very bland, right? So you take the spices, you marinate your meatballs with it. How much? Um, I don't, I don't weigh anything, right? Um, which is a bad thing because then people never have a, never have a recipe to, to edge on to. But the best thing to do is to take a teaspoon at a time and put it into your mix, uh, whether you're using 500 grams or a kilo. And then what you need to do is you need to taste it. So the minute you taste the, the spices in it, you stop. Okay? So that's the guideline. The same as salt, right? You don't put a whole bunch of salt into, you know, into the dish and then you can't take it out. So you put a little bit at a time. Now, I made some chicken stock. Why? Um, it's a norm as a chef to always have stock. Okay? Uh, in the past, we did not use any stock to make the chicken pie because the flavour from the chicken and from the meat apparently is enough. But because I'm a chef, I always have chicken stock. So we're using chicken stock today um, to do the pie. Oil. I've got also a mix of shallots and onions. We're not going to use all of it, but we're going to use some of it. How much shallot and how much, how much onions? I think you... 50% um, you know, if you use 250 grams of shallots, use 250 grams of, of um, Bombay onions. The reason for this is that the Bombay onions gives you the sweetness and the shallots gives you the pungency that you want in, in the dish, right? So a mixture of both. Uh, don't be afraid, you know, a lot of people when they cook, they tend to be afraid of, of putting too much oil. If you don't put enough oil, it will be very difficult to fry this, to cook this properly. So you must have enough oil. Um, you can do two ways. You, you, you can cook this dish two ways in the sense that you can put your oil in at a low temperature 
and then you can cook it for a very long time, or you put it in at medium temperature and you cook it at a shorter time. Okay? We're putting it at medium temperature, which is about, I would say, gas mark uh, three or four. So I'm going to use only half of what I have here, which should be sufficient. Let me use mine. So the, the Christmas pie is today the Christmas pie is eaten at different times of the year sometimes in January sometimes in June it's no longer a dish that you know um, signifies that it's time to celebrate Christmas but in the past you know to have an elaborate pie like this was was special it was special because things were not cheap then beef was very expensive yeah um, so was chicken. Can anybody tell me, you know, what, what was the cheapest ingredient in the 50s and 60s? You know what was the cheapest? Fish. Fish was the cheapest. So we ate fish every day, and fish got me to this size. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's, it's fish or pork. Beef was imported, so it's always very expensive. Yeah? Um, so it was, it was a dish that actually was celebrated once a year and the pie and the pie was only eaten um, well we ate it on the 26th as well but more importantly the pie was always eaten after we came back from midnight mass okay so granddad would be cooking different dishes. He would start probably like the 23rd or 24th of December. Some dishes in the Eurasian uh, repertoire takes three days to cook. I'm not kidding you. I've just finished one dish. It takes three days to cook. Um, so if I do that dish here, you have to come back three times, which I don't want. I don't want you all to do that. Um, why, why only after midnight march? Actually, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense because you want to celebrate um, you know, dishes like feng, dishes like dibal, dishes like, um, what do you call this, um, abajor. You want to have that on the 25th itself, right? So you go to midnight mass, and when you came back, you only ate one dish, and that dish was the Eurasian Christmas pie. So everybody gathered around the table, granddad, mom, all the kids, and that's what we ate. We ate Eurasian Christmas pie. So every year, after mass, it was in our head already. We're going to have Christmas pie today because it's Christmas Eve, right? So we came back, we ate our Christmas pie, and we did whatever we needed to do. We went to sleep. Tomorrow morning was no more Christmas pie. It was all the other dishes that we had for Christmas. So today, it's not like that anymore. Um, the last time I cooked this, I think, was for... Um, was was for a friend, I think so, that craved it. Um, so how did, how did the Eurasians come about? They are, I would say, initially from the very beginning, when the Portuguese sort of came to this part of the world, to Malacca, that would probably would have started, that would have, that would have been the start of the first Eurasians, right? When the Portuguese came, they intermarried with um, villagers, they intermarried with people um, within the community in, in Malacca, um, which created your Eurasians that you have in Malacca now. Um, and further, after the Portuguese, it was the Dutch, after the Dutch, the English. Um, so you would think that, okay, so it's just Portuguese, Dutch, and English. Actually, it's a lot more than that. Because the English also intermarried themselves, and some of them actually has, have got German ancestry, some have got French ancestry, and this somehow was, you know, look at Vietnam, it's got a, it's got a French ancestry. And so when you talk about Eurasians, I would say it's more than just Portuguese, Dutch, um, and English. It actually encompasses the whole of most of Europe, I would say, yeah? So you get, you know, mine is a very common name, the silver. You get Lengi, 
you get gross, you get shell kiss, you get fruit nut. There, is, there are so many different types of Eurasian. Today, the Eurasians are not that, I would say, Eurasian anymore. You know, um, when you have a mix of someone who is married into a Chinese family or into an Indian family, you, you know, when you look at me, you know that, oh, this guy looks Eurasian. My friend who's Eurasian doesn't look Eurasian at all. He looks more, he looks more Chinese than Eurasian. And I think that's, that's how we've evolved. You know, that's how we've evolved. So has the, has, the, um, has the culture, has the heritage, has the food evolved? Definitely, okay? I'm sure in certain homes, the Eurasian Christmas pie is done without, without beef because they don't eat beef, you know? So it's done with pork. Um, the influence of the different cultures, I would say, in Singapore expands more than just the Eurasians. It, it goes into, look at the Peranakans, okay? It is not just Chinese and Malay. It's also Indian with the Chiti Peranakans, yeah? So, if you want to make a comparison, I would say that the closest comparison between the Eurasians, as much as the Eurasians don't like it and the Peranakans don't like it, I'm the one that has got the right to say because I'm half and half. The Eurasians and the Peranakan are the most similar in terms of cooking styles, in terms of, um, not so much in terms of culture. I would say the Peranakans are much more, they have, they have a much more richer history, right? Because of the Chinese background that they have. You know, the beaded work that they do, the kabayas that they do, the croissants that they have, the kasot mani that they have. It's all very, very, um, I would say, it's, there's a long history to it, you know, Chinese. Whereas the Eurasians, we do not have that, right? But in terms of food, I would say we're very, very similar to the Peranakans. The Peranakans, has your, they have your um, rempatite, yeah? So chili, baum, baum blachan, bokaras. The Eurasians also have rempatite, chili, baum, blachan, bokaras. Exactly the same, whether you use dried chili or fresh chili or fresh chili and dried chilies, it always goes with shallots, kettle nuts and, and blachan. So, very, very similar. And there are dishes that we cook that the Peranakans cook as well. The Peranakans don't cook Eurasian Christmas pie. Don't ask me why. So, it's really, really interesting, you know, when you talk about, you know, how, how the Eurasians have evolved um, and what we are today. Unfortunately, if you go to a lot of homes today, not many people, this is an easy dish. So, you can, you can do this, you can do this dish in like an hour, right? But the dishes that take a long time, you, you go to any Eurasian home today, it's gone. Everything's gone, right? This is like Singang. This is like Eberjaw. This is like Feng. Why? Because it's too troublesome. It's, 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 there's too much work, you know? Um, you, need, you need hands. One person is going to, is going to take too long. You need at least, you need at least uh, three pairs of hands and you don't get that anymore. Okay, so what I've done is that I've sweated the, um, the shallot and um, um, the shallot and the onion paste, and I'm going to add carrots first. You know why I'm going to add carrots first? Can anybody tell me why I'm going to add carrots first? You little girl, you should know. You know why I'm adding carrots first? Make a wild guess. Come on, make a wild guess. You don't know why? Because carrots take a little bit longer to cook than chicken, and I've actually cut up the chicken. Yeah? They take a little bit longer to cook. And I don't... I never, never like to fry my potatoes. Don't fry your potatoes, okay? So put your potatoes... After the carrots cook for about five minutes, you add the potatoes in, and then you cook the potatoes. Now, the reason for that is that when you fry your potatoes, what you do, you seal the potatoes up. When you seal the potatoes up, there's no way the flavour can go into the potatoes. No way, right? Um, so, I like flavour in my potatoes. I like to eat potatoes, and I like, you know, I, I, I like to have flavour in it. So, you know what's... Does anybody know what's the accompaniment to the Eurasian Christmas pie. You know, you know what we eat the Eurasian Christmas pie with? You want to make a guess? 
Come on, I'm sure you... Nobody knows? We eat the Eurasian Christmas pie with samba blachan. Okay? So English, Indian, samba blachan is Eurasian. It's bizarre, right? But you see, that, that, that is what culture does to heritage. It introduces different forms of acceptance and it becomes part of what you are, you know? And the thing you want to do is you want to embrace it rather than push it away. Because when you embrace it, you learn how important being who you are is. You know, I, I, I find it very sad when I talk to people, especially the younger generation, and I ask them, so what's your ethnicity? And they say, my ethnicity is Chinese. I say, yes, but what are you? Are you Hakka? Are you Teochew? Are you Hokkien? Are you Hokchu? Are you Cantonese? What are you? Um, I don't know. You must know at least a little bit. What does your parents, what do your parents speak? English. What, do you, what does your grandmother speak? I think she speaks Cantonese, but she's not Cantonese. So she must be Hakka, I think so, right? So they don't know, you know? And I think that's very sad that you don't know who you are, right? It's not that, it's not their fault, it's not their parents' fault, it's, you know, I think what's, what has happened with Singapore is that we've embraced Western culture far too long. There's nothing wrong with Western culture. It's good, okay? But we must not forget who we are. Little girl, what's your ethnicity? Sorry? Hokkien and? Hokkien and Teochew. Okay. You must remember that, okay? Do you know a Teochew dish? No. How can you not know a Teochew dish? I give you a very simple Teochew dish, and I know you'll like it. Do you like Oni? You don't like Oni? How can you not like Oni? It's such a wonderful dessert. You know? <laughs> she doesn't like duck as well. No, a lot, of, a lot of the younger kids don't like that. Yeah. It's, it's all right. It's all right. Because you will grow up, and one day, right, someone will buy braised duck and give it to you, and without saying anything, you will take it and you put it into your mouth. And all of a sudden, you open your eyes and you say, where have you been all my life? You know what I mean? So, what you have to do is that you have to try. Don't say you don't like. Just put it in your mouth and try it. And if it doesn't suit your palate now, it's okay. Five years down the road, you try it again. Trust me, there's going to be one day that you are going to like it. Now, what's so important about this is because... Let me tell you a story, okay? Let me tell you a story. When I was growing up, there was a dish that my granddad did, and I hated it. Okay? You know why I hated it? Because it had onions. And I didn't like onions. I used to take the dish and I used to push all the onions aside. And I only ate the beef. And there was a, there was a paste that was there that I didn't know what it was, you know but I just ate the beef. That's it, okay? And it was because of the onions. So I grew up, and then eventually, I began having an interest in cooking. So I asked my grandfather, Pop, can you teach me how to cook? My granddad, this is on my, this is the Eurasian side of the family. Pop, can you teach me how to cook? And it was very easy. What do you want to cook? Your mother cooks, I cook. You go and study. Don't cook. Very natural for grandparents or parents to do that before. Don't want you in the kitchen. Go and study. 
But for me, it was very, very simple. Because what my grandfather did and what my grandmother did were different. Same, but different. From different cultures, right? My grandmother, also the same. Never allowed me into the kitchen, okay? So I told my grandfather, I said, you know, my grandmother, my mother can cook. My father can't cook, for, can't cook to save his life. If you die, who's going to cook for me? No one. So I want to I wanna cook. I want to learn. Okay? So that's how, that's, how I ended up, that's how I ended up here. It wasn't something that I did all my life. I only started cooking professionally when I turned 40. So it wasn't something that I did all my life. Okay? But going back to this onion thing. So he did a lot of dishes. I know a lot of dishes that he cooked. Most of them usually during Christmas. Why? Because as kids, you help. Child labor, free. No need to pay money, right? But it was very common then. You go to any home, you find kids, you know, helping their parents, helping their grandparents to do things. It was very, very common, right? So I think I probably have about 75% of my grandfather's repertoire. And you are probably saying only 75%. Uh. Let me tell you this. I have a sous chef that's worked with me for 20 years. He probably knows only 30% of my repertoire. So imagine 75%. It's still stuck in here and it will never go away. You know, what I, you know, what I, you know what's very hurtful for me? Dishes that I did not learn. And a lot of the dishes that I did not learn contain onions because I didn't want to eat onions. Do I regret it? Yes. A lot. A lot. But because I have taste and because I have memory and I have a wonderful mother that always guides me and tells me what, what to do, and because of that, I can somehow remember some of the dishes that he used to cook. Okay, this is, this is quite a bit of meat. So I probably cooked this for about 20 minutes already. Yeah? So I'm going to add the chicken now. The people, I, I guess the people can see, right? Can they see? Now they can see, right? Okay, so it's not, it's not very wet. It's actually very dry, right? So what you, what you want to do now is if you want to extract as much of the chicken flavor as you can. I'm just going to put all of it in. I'm a little bit like my mother. You tell her five people are coming, she cooks for 40 people. It's true. You know, it's true. I always tell her, Mom, I got my, my friends, friends coming over. I say, Mom, don't cook, don't cook too much. Huh? There's only about five, six of us. And then when my friends come, my friend like, hey, who else is coming? I say, no, just you guys. It's intimidating, you know. When people come to a house for Christmas, yeah, it really is intimidating. There's not two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve dishes. At any one time, right, on the table, there's about 16 dishes. Any one time. I'm not kidding you, you know. You don't know where to start, right? You walk into the house, you see the food, you're like, wow, how, you know, you don't know. Everything looks good. So you start from here, okay? And eventually you get to the end and you don't want to go home. You just want to sit down and you want to relax. So you know what's my biggest fear? My biggest fear this year that we only can have, we already, my mom has got, sorry, mom, uh, my mom has got four people at home, Okay? So you only can have five people at one time. How? I, I, I really don't know how we, we're going to do this. And mom has already told me she can't cook anymore. Well, not that she can't cook, she's old. So I have become, I've taken over her responsibility. So I have to tell her, mom, from 8.30 to 10.30, you call this group. From 10.30 to 12.30, you call this group. And I was doing it, right? 
And then when I got to about 11 o'clock at night, I said, Mum, this cannot happen, Mum. We have to do it on the 26th as well, right? And that's what's going to happen. In the past, we start having people at 8.30 in the morning. By the time we reach about 10 o'clock at night, there was at least about 100 people that have come into the house already. And that's how it is for us. So it's, very, it's the same for Chinese New Year. It's the same for Christmas. You know, you know what I like about Christmas? And it's, it's, it's funny. I, mean, I like the things that, that people would probably say, this guy is crazy. But it's true, you know. I like the part before Christmas. I like the 21st, or even before that, when you start making, when you start making acha, when you start doing all the work, right, which leads up to Christmas, okay? And you know, from the time you start doing the work and the time on the 24th, you know, Granddad is still at the back cooking. We go to Mass, we come back, he's still there. We go, we help him stir. You know, that before we never used flames, yeah? Everything was cooked with charcoal. So you imagine, yeah, the, the back of our house, we had at least about eight or nine charcoal stoves. You know, it's, it was like a restaurant, right? And everything would be cooked in big pots and then we left it open. Never in the fridge, you know, always left it out till the next day, okay? That was what I enjoyed the most. You know why? Because the next day when people came, right, they were all so happy. They come happy, they leave happy. And to me, that is Christmas. You know, seeing people coming, seeing people eating, and appreciating what your heritage is. I love that. I, 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 I really, really love that. For me, that's the biggest thing. So this year, I don't know how. You know, I'm only going to cook. I, 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 I told my mom, you know, I said, Mom, I can't. i got to work. I can cook only on the 25th. And you can only have 30 friends, Mom. So she's inviting only half of her family. Um, but what can you do? Right? So anyway, back to this. So now you add your stew spice, okay? Um, for one kilo of chicken meat, I would suggest yes. one tablespoon of stew spice. You all have the recipe, right? right? You don't. Okay. I think, I think somehow the recipe will be available online. Am I right? Yeah, the recipe will be available online. So you can just go online and you can get the recipe. And if you cook and if it's not the same, you go and see Fabian. Don't come and find me, okay? It should be all right, okay? Because it's a recipe that I've tested. I've tried and tested so that there won't be any issues with it. Okay, so by now, it's still dry, but... I never add liquid until I feel that the chicken has released its liquid. Only then, I will cook it a little bit more and then I'll add liquid to it. Um, okay, so what you do is that you are, what you're doing is that you're breaking the proteins in the meat down. Okay, so chicken contains a lot of water for some strange reason, fresh or it just contains liquid. So when the, when the liquid is released, right, that's when the chicken seals itself. So that's what you want to do, you want to seal it, okay, and then you want to put the flavour back into it again. It's like, you, it's like a steak, you know, it's like a steak. So high heat, seal, and then put the flavour back, back into the meat again. Okay, in about another five minutes, I will put in the stock. Um, if you're too lazy to make stock, make stock. Okay, don't be lazy. Go and buy chicken bones. It's, you know, buy the backbone, right, or the breast, but the backbone is always better. Uh, the carcass is not expensive. Um, and clean it well, you know, 
heat up the water, throw your bones in it. After two hours, you would have a, you know, skim all the time. You have, you have a good color and you can use it for so many things, right? Um, does anybody know that the original wonton, you know wonton mee, right? The soup. Do you know it contains chicken bones? No, right? It's pork and chicken. Because if you use only pork, the flavour is too strong. You need the flavour of chicken to bring the subtleness of the, one, of, the, of the soup down. So when you drink it, right, the sweetness is not only of pork, it's the balance of chicken and pork. So chicken, bo chicken, very important, okay? So I'm going to put the stock in now. So how much stock? I always say enough to cover the meat. So what has happened here, you can't see and do want to tilt it. So if you look at the water, right, there's just a little bit of meat that is just above, right? It's covered, it's covered everything nicely. And that's what you want. Okay? And you don't put salt now, you put salt later. So we're almost there. So with these spices, um, I've got to remember this very carefully. I think you can go to roots.sg and there are some paintings, I think, on the William Farco collection, right? You can, you can go there and you can have, a, you know, an idea about where your spices come from. You know, spices are really, really interesting, right? You think, you know, it's only India, but actually it travels all over the, it travels all over the world, right? From as far as South America to Africa, and it comes, you know, it, it, the, 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 the spice route, if you, if you start off, let's say, from Indonesia, Batavia, that it was known then, right? And then it goes up to the Straits of Malacca, it passes India, Goa, it goes to Africa, and then it goes to Europe. And with every port that it goes, it influences the cooking, you know? And, and, and that's the beauty of spices. You think that, you know, we only use it here in Singapore and in this part of the world. No, it is shared, in, it's shared everywhere around the world. And, and that's the wonderful thing, I, I think, about what spices actually, you know, does for us. It not, it not only helps us in the cooking, it also gives us a historical background of how spices have traveled and helped us over the years to become closer more than anything else, you know? Uh, even you go to China, um, black cardamom, sako. Do you all know black cardamom? Yeah? The, the Hakkas use black cardamom a lot, right? Um, and I, you know, it's strange because they use it more than any other part of China, the Hakkas. Everything, whenever they stew, they would use black cardamom. So little girl, what's your favourite dish? You don't, why? You must have a favourite dish. At least one. Give me one favorite dish. Don't tell me chicken rice. I don't want to hear. Don't tell me chicken rice. What's your favorite dish? Chi kueh. No. Roti plata. No. Nasi lemak. No. Luncheon meat. No. Sorry. Sorry. Chicken rice. Why chicken rice, huh? I'm going to put the meat in now, okay? Or rather the meatball. Why chicken rice? Because it's easy to eat? Because you like chicken? Because you like chicken. And which part of the chicken do you like the most? The wing. No? I'm, put I'm putting a lot of pressure on the mother, yeah? <laughs> Okay, so sausage goes in. If you want to, 
you can add quills eggs. Okay? If you want to. You can also add mushrooms. Don't add button mushrooms. In the past, they use button mushrooms, but you can add um, um hang on, ah, uh. it'll come, it'll come, it'll come. Um, you know the fresh button mushrooms? Yeah, you can add those. Or you can add the small round portobello, the brown ones. They work as well. Okay, so it's almost done. Now to taste. I don't have a spoon. I didn't bring one. It's very, very, very good. So much, you say so much, so much salt? salt? I tell you this, huh? Salt is the most important ingredient in cooking. If you don't put enough salt, you won't extract flavor. So salt is important. Too much is not good, but the right amount is important. Okay? So this is going to bake. So what's going to happen is that you don't bake it straight away. You leave it alone until it cools down, and then you put it into a tray. The size of the tray is... Uh, you know, you, when you go and buy your aluminum tray, it's a big one, and then you have the smaller one, right, which is the half size. That's the size will fit everything in there, okay? And then you take your eggs. Now is when you can put your mushrooms in. Don't cook your mushrooms for too long because you're going to bake it in the oven, right? So when the thing cools down, you put it into the tray. Take your eggs, put your eggs in. You can use um, bigger eggs, and then you can halve it, or you can use quail eggs, and then you don't have to do anything, okay? Puff pastry. If you, do, if you don't know how to make puff pastry, go to the supermarket, buy. Okay? I want to tell you, make puff pastry, it's too much work. Too much work. Okay? Puff pastry is a lesson in itself. So go to the supermarket and buy. I, 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 I think it's better. Otherwise, you know, I don't know when your pie will be ready. So that's it. Um, if you look at the pie that I've done... Okay, I've been told to show. You, you guys can come and take a look at it afterwards. Lah. So, you know how TV is, right? It's always magic, right? That things all of a sudden come to the surface. So I, we tend to do a thick, I can't lift it up because it's too heavy. So if you look at the crust, you can see it's quite thick, right? Um, and when you, when you buy puff pastry, sometimes it comes in sheets that, that you can pull up. Don't buy that one. Don't buy that one. You buy the ones where they come in a block, a rectangular block. And then you take it out, you bring it down to room temperature with a rolling pin in flour, you roll it. That's much better. Because with the, with the sheets, right, very thin. And you know the best thing about pie is pastry. That's the best thing about pie, pastry, yeah. So, so buy the one that you can roll out, okay? Okay, this is done. Um, are there any questions that... We're done! You want to try, is it? All of you. Well, you, you, you can try. I, I mean, I, I've done one for, for you guys to try. It... All right, thank you, uh, Chef Damien, for sharing with us how you make this wonderful pie. And yeah, so thank you very much for attending. Those of you who are in the museum, thank you for 
taking time to come down to the museum and to view this program. And for those viewers at home, also thank you for taking time to watch this uh, program. So um, do follow the recipe. The recipe is in the description box. Okay, you can take it. Uh, for those of you, you can, you can take the recipe later. You can, you can just um, and try at home for this year's Christmas if you want. Okay, so if you like. If you like this program, do follow us on our Facebook page or our Instagram page to be kept up to date with our latest uh, NMS programs. Other than that, um, yeah, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.